Hi everyone, this is Nadine Gilkison, and I wanted to share with you this presentation because I really feel that it's very valuable as you're trying to design your lessons um, for distance learning and planning with COVID in mind. So my most popular presentation right now, Ignite Insta Influencers or Teaching with an Insta Frame of Mind. So in this session, I'm going to give you some market research at the beginning. Um, that I'm going to share with you about uh, how people are marketing to Generation Z and then how you can apply those skills and that active research into your classroom tomorrow. So if you haven't read the book, Instabrain, I would highly recommend it. Um, this book is one that I'm going to be referencing several times as I'm doing this presentation because it was so fascinating for me to read the research. As I stated earlier, this is market research and it wasn't even intended for educators, but I was totally engaged as I read the entire book and have it annotated, you know, highlighted everything possible um, and constantly thinking through the lens of education. So Sarah Weiss, as she wrote the book, she did a marketing research study and she asked for participants to plan a trip using their smartphone and screen record their actions. Now, as she did this, she watched participants bound between no less than six apps on their phone and she saw one girl plan a weekend girls trip to Nashville. No search engines were used and in 10 minutes, the person was able to plan every moment of their trip, flights, hotels, activities, and even what outfit that they were going to wear. They found Groupons for activities and they scouted the best food and nightlife. They searched popular hashtags and even analyzed photos on Instagram with precision. They looked at pictures of clubs. If they were slow and no line at 11 o'clock, then they simply weren't going to go there. And what was really interesting was that it was no big deal for the participant. They were not stressed at all while doing it. In fact, they even relished in it. So when we take a look at the different types of social media, I know you may have seen a graphic like this, but I do wanna talk about specific ones on here so that you understand how teens are looking at each type of social media. So in Instagram, they find that as random inspiration, that kind of slice of life that is edited, of course. Pinterest, this one interested me because I didn't think that they still were intrigued with Pinterest at all, but actually they're very active in it. They make different Pinterest boards for inspiration in a specific area. They love YouTube, of course, for how to's, DIYs, and whenever they wanna learn something. Snapchat, they like for behind the scenes and raw footage of their life. Twitter is where they go to get their news, okay? Um, and they use Twitter for announcements from fellow YouTubers, okay? Um, Google is really simply used for finding facts and they're using it for education. That's really their sole use of Google and that search engine. That was very interesting to me as well. Facebook, as we know, they always equate that to parents. Something else that's interesting to note is that the reason why that you're starting to notice that Facebook has added stories, those little snapshots that are going to disappear, it's based on marketing research, knowing that you know any kid that is in that Gen Z or Gen Alpha, they are not going to want something to be permanent. Um, they want, and we all know it's still out there, but they don't care. They want the option of that it can be actually gone in a certain amount of time. So that's the reason why Facebook has been trying to lure them back in by adding stories back in. That's the big reason why that Instagram and TikTok and also um, Snapchat are so popular with them for those very reasons. So I think it's important to see the breakdown of the difference between millennials, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha. Um, and the reason why that I think that it's interesting to see this, uh, these are cited as examples from her book. 
Um, but she found that whenever she did her research studies, if she asked certain questions, then she already knew without asking the participant, what year were you born? She knew if they answered these questions with certain answers that she could tell if it was a millennial, a Gen Z or a Gen Alpha. So a millennial is going to have the helicopter parents. This was interesting. If she asked them, did you have high speed Internet when you were in high school? And they answered yes. She knew right away that they were a millennial, which I thought was really interesting. And this one blew me away. If she asked the kid only one question and said, hey, are you still on your parents cell phone plan? And they answered yes then they're a millennial. Now, as I have been doing this presentation this summer, as I've been doing it live with participants, I get a lot of people that have a look on their face and they're like, oh my gosh, that is my kid. My kid is still on my cell phone plan right now. Um, or they have um, kids that are in the room if I'm doing this when I was live streaming and the kids in the background are like, oh my gosh, she's right. Um, so a, another one is that millennials feel like that parents were still considered that single source of truth. So compare that with Gen Z, which people were asking me, you know, why isn't um, why isn't Gen X on here? And Gen X can be a mixture between the millennial and the Gen Z. But we know that right now that we're experiencing Gen Z and Gen Alpha. So that's why I wanted to focus on those in here. So Gen Z. Rather than having the helicopter parent, they're finding out that it's very much technology parenting, that we're leaning on technology a lot to do our parenting. Um, these kids are versed in having an online presence and the risks of being online because they've had it ever since they have been born. Hence that preference again to Snapchat and TikTok because they want to know that something in their eyes is only going to be there for a short amount of time. Also a reason why that Gen Z is going to have multiple social media accounts to share different types of information with a different audience. That's why we often hear that they have several Instagrams so that that way they can determine who is it that they want to see the certain information. Now these kids are hungry for work and they ultimately want to work for themselves. How do you know that? When you ask these kids, what do they say a lot right now? I want to be a YouTuber. OK, they want to be independent. They don't want to have to work for someone else. They want to work for themselves. But it is nice to know that they are hungry for work and they're willing to work hard. All right. So Gen Alpha, if you are a classroom teacher and you are teaching at the lower elementary grades, this is you. OK, and I'm sure that you already know these things. These kids are craving a smartphone, but they have no intention of ever calling anyone. So as far as my own kids, I have four kids and uh, my three youngest. I have twins that are getting ready to start sixth grade and I have a uh, another. My youngest child is getting ready to go into fifth grade. We recently didn't get them smartphones that they could use to call anybody. We just had old smartphones that, you know, it only works inside of the house, but the kids kept begging us for them. Not because they have any intention on ever calling anybody. That's not what they want. They want the access to being able to message and contact and text and communicate with their friends, but it doesn't matter to them at all if they are going to call someone. They learn by doing. So when we start to think about strategies of how we can help these kids, learn by doing is something that we need to remember. And this one I thought was, was pretty interesting too. They have always been interacting with artificial intelligence and voice assistants. So it's gonna be really interesting to me to see, you know, like over the next five, over the next 10 years, what that's going to look like as these generations continue, because when we know that, that these kids are used to that. So that obviously rings true when we hear the kids say, hey, you know what? I mean, what's the point of me doing this? I mean, just wake me up when I'm famous. So the interesting part about that is that um, if you are able to get their attention, 
on here, um, we're going to talk about some strategies of how you can lure them in. So here are some more interesting facts that I tried to put into this little infographic for you. So these kids today have the ability to juggle five screens at a time. Now you're thinking five. What do you, what do you mean five? Well, just think about it. And probably while you were doing, you know, distance learning with COVID, a kid can be on their smartphone. They can be on a laptop. They can be on a tablet. They can be watching something on their TV and they could also be gaming and having some type of gaming platform. But basically they're saying that their brains have evolved to process and harness information at a faster speed. That's the evolution of the brain as technology has been improving. The ability to filter and make a decision about content can happen in eight seconds. And that is a little frightening because basically what they're telling you, and this is market research, that if you are putting something up for a Gen Z or even a Gen Alpha to take a look at, they're gonna look at it and within eight seconds, they're gonna decide if it's something that they're interested in or not, okay? So again, don't freak out teachers. I'm gonna talk about some strategies of how you can hook them within that eight second window. So they can determine staged content versus real on social media. And by me saying that, I do not mean like fake news. No, they're still not good at that. You still need to teach them that. What they are good at is when they are looking out on their social media platforms, for instance, they prefer a YouTuber who is genuinely authentic and real with them. If someone is heavily promoted and they are constantly throwing in how they have, you know, all these paid sponsorships and it's in their face, that doesn't seem as authentic to them. And so they can't stand it. And so they're not going to follow someone who has more of that staged content. They want to have somebody who has it loosely layered in because we all know that they're going to have sponsorships in there. But how the person is able to layer it in is something that they're very good at recognizing. This was also interesting to me. Um, there is a decline in kids looking up to celebrities like how we had, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about when I was a kid and, you know, like if you would see a movie star or whatever, and when you were a little kid and you might, you know, idolize that person. Um, instead, they're looking for someone who is real and authentic, and it's not genuinely going to be like a movie star. It is going to be someone that's on a social media platform that is being authentic to them. They're always looking to be inspired in some way. So the good news is, is that if you get their attention, this was really key to me. If you get their attention, then they do like a hyper focus mode and then they are going to deep dive into something. So when they were doing this market research and they were watching kids, when they went into that mode where they were doing that hyper focus, if they go onto their social media platform and they find something that they like, they're then going to go, ooh, well, what else did this person create? What else have they done? Oh, do they have a YouTube channel? Oh, they do have an Instagram. I wonder if they're on Snapchat. Then what they're going to do is they're going to scroll through and take a look at all of the content that is out there and that is available to them. Um, I'm going to share a tip that I actually got from my Google Innovator mentor, which is Matt Miller, the author of Ditch That Textbook. Um, part of my Google Innovator project is trying to build a brand um, for dyslexia. So I came up with hashtag dyslexic mindset, but I was struggling with how to market it and how to get enough content. And Matt gave me the best advice ever. He said, you have to do what we call stock the pond. So it really rings true to me when you think about this hyper focus. If somebody is really into your content, they don't want to know the one thing that you've done. They want to see all of it. They want to see all of your work. So that concept of stock the pond means that you're going to have enough content that someone could hyper focus and they can deep dive into your content. Because if you don't have that much for them to scroll down and see, you're going to lose them. 
you're going to lose them right there. So take that advice as I'm talking about this. So this was really interesting too. There is a giant difference to them between searching and browsing. So a search engine is going to give them precisely what they want. But teens don't like that. They like to browse. Now, if they need to get exactly what they want for the classroom, yes, that is, again, when they're going to use Google. But what they paid attention to is that this is the reason why you notice on the social media platforms that they have a discovery tab. You know, you think about Snapchat, you think about TikTok. All of these have that discovery tab. And the kids really prefer to do that because they're just browsing. They're just looking for some type of inspiration. Hey, it may not be exactly what I'm looking for, but you know what? I'm just in the mood to do that inspiration. I can scroll and scroll for hours looking at new content. They become desperate to cling on to one of these uh, sparks that they find in that. So this part was incredibly creepy to me, but it actually does make sense. All right. So I, as all adults, I'm pretty sure, um, get totally creeped out that either when I'm talking to somebody and then I go out to Instagram or Facebook or something, and you know how we see those ads magically appear? It's either that I'm talking to somebody or I may have gone out and searched it, but now that I went to my social media, it's popping up and it's customizing those ads. We as adults get totally creeped out by that. But basically what they found out through market research is that kids actually like that, okay? They prefer the personalization and it's not creepy to them. It knows you because you let it know you and it's telling you what to click. And that's terrifying because that means that the generation is dependent on it to find out what interests them rather than them using their own brains to go out and find that they would rather rely on artificial intelligence to go out and decide for them what interests them. So again, that probably totally creeps you out. I know it did for me, but I have to acknowledge that research and know that research as I'm an educator and I'm thinking about how I'm planning my lessons. So they are natural analysts. They have the ability to take large amounts of information and break it down into smaller and more manageable groupings and chunks to make sense of it. You might not think that as an educator, but again, think back to the market research and that study that they did where they asked the kids, hey, I want you to plan a trip and you have to do all of this and I'm gonna give you 10 minutes to do it. Remember all the different apps that they went to and they weren't even stressed about it? That's because they are natural analysts. So play into that feature when you are designing lessons. And we'll talk about some ways to do that. So you need to understand that every time that a kid is looking at their social media, they're filtering their information into three buckets. And when I read this, really, honestly, everybody's doing this. We're all filtering our social media information into three buckets. Bucket number one is inspiration. Uh, this makes me feel motivated or interested. Bucket two, education. Okay, um, I learned something new. I learned how to do something. Or it's going to be bucket three, entertainment. This is something where hey, I'm going to zone out while binging on YouTube and Netflix. I mean, we all do that. Okay, <laughs> um, so that is really information. That's really good information to know as you're trying to design lessons that these three buckets exist. So by now, you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, well, what in the world can I do? So if schools, educators, and educational institutions aren't going to take a look at this market research, they're going to find it challenging to cope with the demands of Gen Alpha children if you don't try to update yourself and think about new approaches to education. So you're probably like, okay, what? What, what is it that I can do? All right. So one of the biggest things that I learned in this book, and remember, this book is not intended for educators, but the author actually has a whole section talking about Quizlet. And I was like, what? How, how did this happen? And she said what she found out from students is that Quizlet is one of the most 
revered most popular apps out there for teens. Why? Because it enables students to list and study flashcards of information. It even has lists made by, made by other students that are taking the same class as them. If they're in their school or not, it doesn't matter. Um, it gives you really that new meaning to social studies, okay? Um, they actually interviewed students and ask them, you know, why? Why is it that you like Quizlet? And one of the kids was making comments and saying, well, I love it because, you know, hey, uh, if a teacher is going to give me a review study guide uh, to get ready for a chapter assessment, I can use theirs. But a lot of times there's going to be questions on the test. So I need more. I crave more. What else is out there? What are the other possibilities of things that could be on that assessment? I'm going to go to Quizlet. I'm going to go to Quizlet and I'm going to see maybe there's another teacher that's out there that's already made a review for this class. There could be a student who made a review for this class. Again, it doesn't matter if they're at your school district or somewhere else across the country, across the globe. OK, but then you want to stop and think. And, and you know, when they asked the kids, it was like, wait a minute. What if you study it and you get a bad grade because you picked the wrong Quizlet to study? And these kids' response was, well, then I keep track of that and I know never to use that person's again. But if I did well on the quiz or I did well on the assessment, then I start to track who the important people are to follow. So holy cow, if you're not using Quizlet in your classroom, honestly, it doesn't matter because the kids are using it anyway. But if I were you, I would definitely be checking out Quizlet if you aren't using it in your classroom. So speaking of which, crowdsourced learning on the go is what they prefer, which makes total sense to me. What the kids are telling us is that, hey, if it's crowdsourced, which means if I can go out and not only study one person's materials, but others, See, I want you to think about these popular applications that teachers are using in the classroom. Quizzes, Kahoot, Quizlet, you know, all of these GimKit. When we're using all of these, they were designed for teachers. So teachers can create all of these review decks. And so then we can see what else is out there because it is crowdsourced. Well, kids are smart. They're using it because it's crowdsourced and they're tapping into that potential as well. The other thing that all of those items share is they are a mobile smartphone app. And the kids don't wanna carry around a laptop with them. So it has to be device friendly because they want learning on the go. They want it to be anywhere that they're at. So remember these two things knowing that any time that a kid is studying for an assessment, these are their preferred methods, okay? So let's get started into strategies. So now that we've heard all of this research, you're probably like, what can I do? What can I do as a teacher? Don't worry, I've got you covered, okay? Number one, we know that they crave digital design and that visual design, okay? Why do we know this? Because think about their social media. Grabbing the attention of visual Gen Z means that it's gotta have eye-catching graphic design in a presentation and video. Why? Because social media is mostly visual. And they have Gen Z in their mind whenever they're creating those designs. An influencer is paying someone to look professionally designed with specific colors and font choices. They know that they've got eight seconds to get their attention and by gosh, it better be with a visual design, okay? So how can you mimic that as a teacher? I don't wanna overload you with tons of different options, but I've got a few here to get you started. Canva is one site that you can use. It's basically going to turn you into looking like a really good graphic designer because it tells you, hey, which here's a good font that goes with this. Here is an image that looks great with this and we're gonna package it all for you and now you can use it. Okay, so that's one option. Adobe Spark does the same thing as Canva and I'm gonna be honest here, I actually lean on Adobe Spark more than Canva. Not that I don't love Canva, but Canva kind of has like this mix of 
it's a freemium. It'll say you can do these things for free. Ooh, but look, you can use this graphic. It's only a dollar for the graphic. Oh, you want to save this? Um, well, now that you've chosen these graphics, you're going to have to pay a dollar or two dollars. Um, and so I just I can't stand that. But I don't want you to know. I, I want you to know that it is an option that's out there. Adobe Spark lets you do the exact same thing, but it's all 100 percent free for educators. So that's why I'm telling you I love it. Unsplash. Anytime that I create a presentation, I'm always using Unsplash for the backgrounds. I cannot tell you how many times that people come up to me and they're like, oh my gosh, did, are, are, do you do like photography on the side? Is that how you get those backgrounds? <laughs> That's so sweet, but no, no, I don't do that at all. I use the Unsplash Chrome extension, okay? You can Google it. I'm going to give you a link in a minute that's going to um, take you out to another presentation uh, that's going to give you all kinds of goodies. So Giphy, if you like animated GIFs, then you can use the Giphy Chrome extension. When you use that, that flashing arrow that I've got there, you can easily use Giphy to do that to get any animation that you want to add to your presentations. Just keep in mind that you don't want cognitive overload for your students. Choose a few items to add the animated GIFs, but don't GIF them to death, because if you do that, they're going to be distracted and they're not going to know what in the world to click on. OK. Um, also, I have an entire other presentation that I have linked in the uh, Teaching Digitally resource guide all about different ways to design digital content. So many more tips, but again, I just wanted to share a few to help you guys out. Set the stage to engage. It's so important to do that. So how can you do that? I've got a collection here of different templates that you can click on. And one of them, this topic of study, it's a Google Slides template for Insta Stories. And it was created by a really good friend of mine. Um, and her name is Amanda Sandoval. And she has not only that template, but I'm going to be showing you a bunch of other stuff that she's got as well. OK, um, TikTok style experiences. You can do that with Matt Miller. And I've got a link directly to the template inside of my presentation. I've also got fake social media templates that you can use as well. And don't forget about Snap Camera. You know, kids love Snapchat. Well, now you can use the filters from Snapchat on Google Meets, on screencasts, on Zoom calls, all of those things are going to set the stage to engage. So all of these templates are free to use. Allow them to curate. So let that sink in. Every time that you are creating your lessons, we as educators are curating the most popular resources that we want to go out to our students. But remember how I told you that they are natural analysts and they can analyze information and put it into chunks? Think about how they are rapidly filing all of the different things that they like in Pinterest and in uh, Instagram and all of those different places. So how can you mimic that in the classroom? Use Pinterest, okay? If you're a secondary teacher and your kids have access to Pinterest, why not tell them this is the upcoming unit of study and why don't you go out and you curate resources to go with this topic? So Pinterest is one idea. Wakelet is another website that you can use if you don't want to use Pinterest. And what I like about Wakelet is the fact that it is a mix between Pinterest and Padlet together. So not only can you add um, links to sites, but you can link Google files and different things. So basically, check out Wakelet if you haven't. Now, if you teach younger students and you're like, there is no way I'm going to let these kids freely curate themselves, that's crazy. OK, you can do what you call like guided curation. You can have student choice of curation. You go out and you curate the items, but you give them lots of choices for them to go through. So it is a it's a sheltered form of letting them curate. You go out and curate for them at the elementary age and then give them those choices. 
make it worthy. Okay, we always hear all the time about, oh, well, we want you to share out your projects when you're done. Well, a kid is not going to do that and actually uh, share a project on their social media and share it out with the public unless you make a project that's worthy of that. Um, I saw some of my high school teachers that actually gave an assignment where kids got multiple options of what they could do, but one of them was creating a TikTok. And again, that isn't the only option that they got, but because they gave that as one of the options, they started to notice that the kids liked the assignment so well that they were actually putting it on their social media platform. Okay, so think about that. If you're going to do a project that you're like, hey, you know, share this out when you're done, ask yourself, is it good enough that they're going to want to share it out? OK. Mix it up. I cannot stress this enough. You have got to mix up what you're asking the kids to do. If you say, all right, kids, today we're going to play a Pear Deck. Um, all right. We're going to do another Pear Deck today. Oh, we're doing a quiz is and we're going to do another quiz is. Uh, we're going to read an article and then we're going to answer questions. We're going to read an article and answer questions. If you keep it the same all the time, you have lost them. You've lost that eight seconds immediately. So I mentioned before um, about uh, my friend Amanda Sandoval, and we'll get to it in just a moment, um, some of her ways that she was able to mix it up during COVID. But I also talk to my teachers about how there's different levels of e-learning when you make your assignment. If you're at a level one, you're just simply slapping a link in there. If you're at a level two, then you're going to be using digital text, but you're going to add a graphic organizer that's going to have a little bit more higher level thinking. But in a nutshell, it's basically a digital worksheet. OK, that's level two. Level three means you're gonna have multimedia and student choice present. So integrating tools like Flipgrid and Seesaw, when you have those layered in there, then that's how you know that it's a level three assignment. A level four, I've got listed on here a HyperDoc, but it could be an EDU protocol or a visual thinking routine or something like that. But level four is a combination of one, two, and three. And nobody's telling you that every assignment is going to be a level four. But by golly, you better mix it up, because if you don't, again, you're going to lose them during that process. So now let's take a look at my friend Amanda's uh, e-learning. So when I click on this, it's actually going to take us out to her e-learning, which I want to show you on here. So let me have it pull up. So week one, what she had her students do was actually in the format of a game board, which I thought was genius. So she's telling the students, hey, at the beginning of the week, you're gonna start here and you're gonna follow this game board. And she's even got it split by class periods because she teaches a history class at high school, okay? So she's, she's giving them that whole week at a time, telling them what they need to do. She's even got a spot for a weekly check-in, but everything is linked within here that she wants them to do. So that's just week one. So now let's take a look at her week two. So now she's mixed it up. It's still in Google Slides, but take a look. You know, now she's layering in an image of JFK in the background, and he's telling them what they're going to do for the week. If I'm a kid and I'm in her class, I am highly engaged. It, I bet they're waiting at the beginning of the week, like, man, I wonder what she's going to be doing this week, because I am totally intrigued. OK, she has another weekly check in with Flipgrid already listed on here, and she's even got a message for her class on here. Week three, she mixes it up again. I've had teachers say, how in the world did she do this where she's got these images behind? OK, she just went out and found an image of a TV that is a PNG, and then she put animated GIFs behind it. That was genius on her part to do that. But again, it's giving variety to the kids on what it is that they're going to do. She's given them a weekly check-in again, and this time it's using Google Forms. Now, if you like this, you can actually make a copy of her lessons. That's how awesome Amanda is. She shares everything just like I do. 
and you can go out and use this concept with your class as well. So that is truly mixing it up. Voice and choice. You have got to be providing students voice and choice. So how do you do that? Use choice boards. Again, my friend Amanda has everything ready for you, okay? So if I tap this link, it's gonna take you out to a document that has all kinds of information about choice boards. She's helping you out here. You can choose different boards that have already been created. How do you use a choice board? She's got you covered there too. You want a template? She has that for you there too. Oh my goodness. All kinds of inspiration, plenty of things for you to check out. Again, all free. That's why I love Amanda. You're awesome. She has another template in here of a choice board that you can take a look at. And I really like this one too because it can go with any topic and she's telling her students, uh, you're gonna read this, you're gonna watch a video, you're gonna do some vocab, but then to show your learning, you get choice. Create an infographic, a digital poster, a photo bento, or create a sketch and tell. And she's given them the slides that they need to do that. Again, you wanna use this, you get to, just go to file and make a copy. So that way you're not messing with her original, okay? So choice boards are awesome. Play the game, all right? These kids love having their uh, influencers layer things in different social media platforms. I learned this um, in market research as well. A really good influencer will put one thing on Instagram and then tell them, hey, if you wanna find the next clue, then go to my YouTube channel. Oh, now you're on my YouTube channel. Now, if you wanna find the next clue, you're gonna to go to my Twitter, okay? Then you could branch out to another social media platform to TikTok. So how do we emulate that in the classroom? There's some options here. We can do Goose Chase. There's a link in the presentation out to it. It's where you can create your own digital scavenger hunt that you want your kids to do. Breakout EDU is a popular platform that people use. There's tons of free digital breakouts that you can do that are just like going to an escape room, but digital, okay? Kids are loving these right now. I also have an image of Gim Kit. And there's a reason why that kids are actually preferring to play GimKit over Kahoot and quizzes and a lot of these other tools. Number one, a high school kid made it, okay? And it's gamified in that the kids are playing for money and that's why they are really attracted to that platform. So those are some options for you to check out. But as always, we have to be aware of their weaknesses we know that they are very weak on social emotional skills, and that's the part that we're gonna have to make sure that we're giving them the supports that they need for it. Because they are so heavy into digital, they need to have these supports. Because as I said, with Gen Alpha, they don't wanna call anybody. They wanna be able to just converse with people through text. And think about our society, and we are really getting in that direction as a whole not just Gen Alpha. And so that's why we're seeing more uh, of our problems with our social emotional awareness. So keep that in mind when you are planning your lessons and what you want them to do. So before I get ready to wrap this up, I want you to know that on Netflix and on YouTube, there are some really good documentaries. About a year ago, Netflix released Social Animals and I watched it. It's gonna make you cringe, cry, and laugh all at the same time. Again, no matter what, especially if you're teaching at the secondary level, you need to know these kids and you need to know what they're going through. And Social Animals shows you the good, the bad, and the ugly with social media. But there's also other documentaries that I found online that I've been able to take a look at. And I feel like all of these are a must see for you guys to understand this generation. Again, on the slide, um, you're going to get access to the presentation, um, and I'll also drop it into the description so you can take a look. All right, I hope you enjoyed it. I know, again, this one really 
uh, rings true for me and it means a lot to me because I feel like you need this research to help you in the classroom. So thanks so much for watching.